14 till I was about 15, we were homeless for close to half a year. And I mean, it's, it's hard to get through it, especially during the winter, but with the right people helping you and knowing the right people to ask for help, community helps you that way. Uh, Beans Cafe is an organization that's been around for 35 years here in Anchorage. We are kind of a real homegrown organization. It was founded here. Everything we do is based here in Anchorage. We're not affiliated with any national organizations. And our mission is to provide a safe day shelter and to feed the hungry and the homeless here in Anchorage 365 days a year. It was started in 83 by Archbishop Francis Hurley in response to deaths in the community due to cold. They found some people that had uh, gone into a dumpster and fallen asleep and frozen. So it started out actually with a social action movement. There was actually a tent city down on uh, the park strip and things like that. And it, the first shelter, I'm not sure where that first building is, but the one before, the building we're in today was built in 2005. Well, back in uh, 1994, uh, I came here and my dad was working for a halfway house, which provided him a room, but just for himself. So me, my mother, my brother, and my sister were all living on a camp, and my father pretty much just forgot about us. And so I was working around the camp, doing people's chores, dishes, taking trash. Me and my mom would scavenge for like wild herbs or berries or mushrooms, and. Eventually, we got kicked off of the campsite because we couldn't afford to pay it anymore, but we still camped, just not allowed areas. Eventually, we uh, ended up, my mom getting tired of the cold because we were living in a tent that held about four people, and our only heat source through the winter was a simple propane tank heater, which is where most of our money went when we did save up money from chores and that. But uh, after she got tired of it, she eventually just went and got a bunch of credit cards and got approved for them and started paying for a hotel. And because my dad's name was on the cards as well, he finally remembered he had a family. And from that, we worked towards looking into a house, but the debt was already there, but we were no longer homeless from it. I think a lot of the clients that we see that have come from the villages um, do have a very hard time adjusting to Anchorage, um, especially if they've been born and raised in a village where they literally know every person, they've known them their whole life. Um, it's sometimes very difficult for them to come to a big city such as Anchorage where they don't know many people. They may have a few relatives or a few friends. Uh, many times they don't make good decisions about who to trust and they don't know who to trust and they, they can get themselves into dangerous situations. I think they also many times underestimate the cost of moving to Anchorage and how much it costs to rent an apartment. You know, have to have a security deposit and a first month's uh, rent and all of these things that make it very prohibitive for them to be successful and to, to be able to sustain independent living in the city. I think Alaska is a unique place. I think people come up here with a lot of expectations. I think recently the unemployment has been much higher outside. So people come here because our unemployment rate is like 5%. So they're thinking I can find a job, I can start a new life, I can make a living. So they sell everything and come up here. Maybe for a job, you know, everyone's heard of fishing jobs because of some of the shows on TV. Maybe a job on the pipeline. I mean, they're just kind of pie in the sky ideas that don't come to fruition. And we've seen the numbers increase drastically in the last five years. So kind of when, you know, 08, the economy really tanked, we saw it started to increase up here. So I think people will always be drawn here for a variety of reasons. And some of those people just won't be able to, to find a way, at least initially, to be housed and to make a life here. Well, homeless for most people is different to my idea of homeless because when most people think homeless, they're thinking lazy or they gave up or they have nowhere to go. But for me, homeless just means you're not paying like rent or mortgage or you have a big place to live in. And it's just, it's more of, I don't think I'd call it homeless. I think I'd call it struggles because Everyone has their 
trials they have to go through in life. And sometimes people have harder ones than most. I mean, from, from being homeless, I learned a lot of skills. I mean, I learned how to preserve wood. I learned how to build shelter. I learned how to keep you know, food preserved well by dirt, by covering in the dirt and the ground. I also learned, you know, how to fish. I mean, one of the things I did to make money was uh, in a popular fishing area. I think it was Rabbit Creek, I think. People went fishing there and they would lose their lures. So late at night, I would roll my pants up and go out into the cold water and go find these people's lures. And then the next day, I'd sell them for like, a dollar or two compared to, you know, stores charging four to five. And I mean, I, I got a laugh out of it one time because a gentleman was saying that I was selling his lure and he was demanding it back. And I told him, I'll go put it back where it was and if he wants, he can go get it then. And other people who were there fishing told him, it's like, you can give the kid a couple of dollars for your lure back. And I mean, that was, that was one of the ways I made money, and I mean, that was the most money I made from doing chores and that, which made me really happy because one day I got to uh, sneak over to the commissary, and I brought home this like roast about this big to share with the family. And I mean, at first my mom was wondering what I did because it just didn't seem like it was possible to get it, but I explained to her how I'd gotten it. Which, you know, that fishing metaphor is kind of funny because you hear about, okay, give them a fish, teach them to fish, and then I had read about, okay, what about access to the riverbank? If they don't have access to the riverbank, they can't fish. But I had never heard that before, and I'm going to add it to my repertoire, what if they don't want to fish? Oh, I never, I never heard of that before. I mean, you know, that aspect of it. I mean, he took it a, a different way than I would because my take is, Okay, does that person not want to fish because they don't know how and they're embarrassed or too shamed to ask? Or do they not want to fish because they don't have the pole, which is where I came from? Okay, let's show them a variety of fishing poles. I go fishing with my husband, right? Don't hand me that one. That's way too complicated. Give me the little Mickey Mouse and I'll throw it in, you know? So maybe it's not the right pole that we're giving them. But, I, you know, it's kind of a fun metaphor because it's so tangible, especially in Alaska. But, you know, he made a point. What if something, somebody doesn't want to fish? But that's what I'd say was set up by those people that were staying here for eight months and not, you know, engaging in any kind of, you know, positive, and again, that's my view, positive change, right? I think there are a lot of stereotypes associated with homeless shelters, and one of them is, is that people don't work or they don't want to work, and, and that's just not the case. Um, in our last social services survey, 12% of the clients surveyed that were coming here for meals have a job. They just don't make enough money to be able to live independently and have enough money for food. So if we can help people remain independent in whatever living situation they're in by helping them maybe towards the end of the month with a few meals, that's certainly worthwhile. I mean, it's home, home's confusing to people because it always has to be a structure or something. Why can't home just be where your friends and family are? That's what home is for me. <laughs> if there's housing stock available, there's at least hope for people to move into that. But in Anchorage, the vacancy rate, the, re the rental rate, that's what we're talking about here, is about 2%. It's very, very low. And the fair market rent is high. And we have people here that for, you know, the majority, not everybody, but have some kind of credit history problem, may have a criminal history problem, may have a rental history problem. So it, it, part of what we have to do here is convince people that, yeah, there's hope we can get you housed. So if there's no place to be housed, it makes it harder, um, especially with all those barriers. Why would a landlord pick someone with barriers versus someone without. So that's where our case management comes in too because we hope that when they know that we're backing them up and if there's a problem they come to us, we hope that helps. But you know, you go, you live in other places. I lived in San Antonio. There was a lot of uh, more affordable housing. So at least if you engage with someone and got them going and had money for first month's rent or deposit, there's a place for them to go at the end of that. But you know, I mentioned at the, at the uh, University of Alaska at Anchorage, Think Tank, that you know, that doesn't always, you know, happen. 
think calling someone a guest changes your perspective. All of a sudden you're like, oh, I am welcoming you into my home. I am welcoming you into Brother Francis Shelter. That's why you're a guest. Um, so I think it, it, it goes from both sides. It's with the staff and the manner in which you treat someone. Um, it should be as how you would like to be treated if you were someone's guest. Right? Um, and then with the actual guest, I would think it gives them a sense of um, this is temporary. You know, this I'm, I'm, I'm not a resident of the Brother Francis Shelter. I am not simply a consumer of their services because a lot of these kinds of organizations, you can consider them clients or consumers. So I think it has the effect of making the individual feel more invested and then perhaps a little better taken care of. And then my mom, uh, my mom had lost uh, her job when we were moved up here. And when she got here, it was hard for her trying to find any work because her field was uh, in bakery. And um, nothing was there that she could really find that would make it convenient for her to stay with us and make sure we were okay and still work. So for a while there, she, she didn't work. Eventually, she did get a job again. I mean, the fair market rate, you have to make $18 an hour to spend no more than 30% of your income on a two-bedroom apartment. So if you're in a situation where you need a two-bedroom, maybe you have a family or a roommate or whatever, you have to make $18 an hour. Well, $18, in fact, I think it's up to 20 now. That's $40,000 a year. You know, there, a lot of people don't make that. So um, again, you throw that in amongst everything else and you've got a real challenge around housing. Well, I am no longer homeless. Um, things, you know, we, we hit through the bricks and the walls and made it through and came out on top. And we tell people, you know, anyone can do it if you want to try. You just have to try. There's people out there willing to help you if you just ask. Last year, our clients volunteered 95,000 hours. That's equivalent of 42 full-time employees. We could not operate the cafe without all the work that the clients volunteer. Every single day, there's 83 positions that need to be filled. Everything from cleaning the bathrooms, to mopping the floors, to cleaning the tables, to prepping, serving lunch, doing everything for the next day, helping get the meals ready for Carlick Manor. We could not do it without the volunteers that are, that are our clients and, out, and exterior volunteers. We also have a lot of volunteers that come in every day from different companies or organizations or clubs. Uh, usually we have between 15 and 20 outside volunteers that come in and help serve meals as well. So as a barrier, which we've never said before, is Catholic Social Services can't do it all. I mean, really up until this year, we've said, we will house every homeless person, we will take this on, it's our responsibility. And this year what we've said is we can't do that. We have to have the community engaged. In Spend some time, teach a class on poetry or resume writing. We have, we have a group of people coming in, they're doing improv. Someone's teaching yoga. That the challenge is seeing the other in us. Probably say that helping at Brother Francis Shelter is not just strictly with funds or strictly with in-kind donations and I mean those are the backbone of how we're able to function as a shelter. I mean we do need and are so thankful for the donation of socks and razors and toothbrushes and, and the toilet paper and everything but I think it's also a great space for folks to come and give up their time. I think that um, if community members wanted to learn a little bit more to start breaking down perhaps some of those misconceptions that they have of the homeless population here in Anchorage, that walking through our doors and saying, what could I do for you? Or perhaps going through our website and saying, how could I, how could I volunteer with you is a great way to, to start thinking about homelessness differently. Because I would encourage the community to approach homelessness and the Brother Francis Shelter with more of an open mind. Um, a homelessness is not just a Brother Francis problem. It is not just a Catholic Social Services problem. It is not just a Fairview problem. It is a problem for the entire municipality, um, the entire state, the country. It's, it's one of the problems that has been going on since people have been living in homes. There's people that don't have them. 
Um, and so I would encourage people to change their way of thinking about how they think of homelessness because many of us don't realize how close we are to homelessness. If we had a medical issue or we lost our job, a vast majority of Americans are two paychecks away from, from becoming homeless. And people don't realize that, that it's very easy to be down here. And that was one of the things that first really struck me when I first started working here is that I've seen that guy on the bus. I've seen that guy at the mall. I've seen that guy at Fred Meyer. He doesn't look like he's homeless. He looks like just a normal guy like me. That's the problem with most people is they won't ask. As for me, uh, I've been dating my girlfriend for a little over a year now. She works up on the slope as a cook. Uh, I'm looking towards our, uh, our next anniversary because we saw this kooky little thing that we're going to start doing. Every anniversary, you'll take a picture. And the next anniversary, you take another picture with the original picture there that you had from the last one and see what it comes up. And we thought that was a cute idea, so we're going to start doing that. Yeah, I'd like to share a story um, that was really meaningful to me and really reinforces why I do what I do every day. I was at the Make It Alaskan show and was wandering around. We had a booth there selling our bean soup mixes that we have that the clients help us produce here and we sell to generate uh, revenue for, for our programs. And it was a slow day and I had a volunteer in the booth so I decided to wander around a little bit and talk to a few people. And I was just drawn to this one booth and there was a, a gentleman there and he makes Navajo inspired wood flutes. I've never played a flute in my life. I, wouldn't, I barely would know what end to hold onto with it, but they were just, something about it just really drew me in. And I started talking with the gentleman, and he played for me, and we chatted, and it came up. I think I mentioned that I work for Beans Cafe, and he reached out, and he grabbed my arm and said, if it weren't for Beans Cafe, I'd be dead. And that was probably one of the most impactful moments I've had in this job. Um, to see somebody that now is a great contributing member of society, has his own business. He introduced me to his wife. I later had coffee with his wife and one of his daughters. He has a beautiful family and he actually is paying it forward. He's helping others to remain drug free and alcohol free and giving them a skill and teaching them to make these wooden flutes and to play these wooden flutes. And he's just such a shining success story um, of somebody that struggles still every day with his sobriety. And it's not easy for him, but he looks at his wife and his children and he knows it's worth it. And he's been able to pay it forward and help other people learn to make flutes, learn to play music. And now he's something he never thought he'd be, which is an educator and a teacher and really, I think, a role model.